Okay, welcome everyone to our seminar today. Our speaker is Nigel Hickson from Penn State. Nigel is going to tell us about the Alka principle and the Lovodovsky theorem. So please, Nigel. Good, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, we were just talking about people uh, in, in Australia, and this is joint work with uh, a student of mine, with a student of mine, Jacob Brad. When the, the bad news started coming in, in, in March, he, he gathered together his belongings and he got on the last plane from uh, State College to Sydney. And uh, that's where he still is now. I'm kicking myself that I didn't, you know, jump into his suitcase and go down with him. <laughs> but that's uh, not what happened. And so I'm, I'm here in, in State College and he's down in Sydney. Good for him or in Wollongong. Good, good for him. All right, so we'll talk about, I'll talk about the uh, Oka principle. I'm just going to rearrange my screen here, just one moment while I do some housekeeping. Uh, here is Oka, Kiyoshi Oka. Uh, I'm not sure whether gravity didn't apply to him or, or, or whether <laughs> what exactly is going on here, uh, but here he is in an interesting um, position. Uh, he was active just before the war, World War II, and, and also just uh, after, and he laid many of the theoretical uh, foundation stones for uh, several complex variables. He's one of the great uh, pioneers. Uh, later on, there were sheaf theorists and there were functional analysts studying co several complex variables from other points of view, but, but Oka's ideas still uh, persist. And I'm going to talk about one of them, which Oka dealt with in, in the context of line bundles. And it's really Grauert who, who went on and, and handled the vector bundle case, which I'm going to be talking about uh, today. Anyway, the, the Oka principle says that if you, if you have uh, an appropriate sort of complex space, complex manifold, and an appropriate type of uh, structure, for example, vector bundle, then studying holomorphic uh, structures is the same thing as studying continuous structures. So for example, on a suitable space, we'll talk about that on the next slide, uh, what suitable might mean. On a suitable space, uh, the bijection between isomorphism classes of holomorphic vector bundles and, and isomorphism classes of topological uh, vector bundles. This is still very much an active subject, lots of interesting stuff uh, going on. Let me uh, attempt to make the theorem uh, just a little bit more uh, precise, or one version of the theorem uh, a little bit more precise. Uh, I won't be talking much about manifolds uh, in this uh, talk. We'll be talking about subsets of CN, uh, compact subsets of CN. And uh, a subset is said to be polynomially convex if, if it satisfies this inequality of each point W which is uh, sub-optimized by the uh, values uh, of, uh, of a polynomial inside of X. I'm not sure I said that very well. Uh, it, it's closed, <laughs> the, the set should be closed under this operation that you see here. I don't think there's a simpler way of saying it than just to tell you to read what's on the slide. That's what a polynomially convex uh, set is. If you're in uh, the plane, this isn't a terribly interesting uh, subject. A subset of the plane, a compact subset of the plane is polynomially convex, uh, if and only if it doesn't have any holes. Uh, but in, in CN, it's rather interesting. You can embed any compact set at all, at least if you can embed it, embed it into CN, then you can re-embed it into C2N in such a way that the image is polynomially convex by this totally real embedding that you see at the bottom here. So there are lots of examples of these, and they show uh, exhibit all sorts of different topological behavior, as many different behaviors uh, as you like. And um, now we have lots of examples. Here's uh, one way of saying what uh, Olka uh, what the Oka principle says, uh, as, as I said earlier, this is not what Oka proved because he was thinking only about line bundles, but this is certainly what Grauert proved. If you have a polynomially convex subset of CN and you have a complex vector bundle on it, on this compact set, then you can always extend it in a unique way to a little neighborhood of X uh, so that it becomes a complex holomorphic vector bundle. There's one and only one way up to isomorphism of uh, doing that. That's uh, Oka's principle or Grauert's uh, theorem. Uh, the fashionable way of stating this is to use the language of Stein manifolds, but we'll, for various reasons, stick with compact subsets of CN uh, here. And uh, so what I'm going to do is prove uh, for you not this theorem, but the obvious K-theoretic version of this theorem. Well, maybe it will be obvious in, in a short time. Uh, a a K-theoretic uh, version of this theorem, and um, which involves Banach algebra. So let me try and uh, explain uh, the connection between polynomially convex sets and, and, and Banach algebras. There are a couple of ways of uh, going about this. Uh, the, the first is the following. If you have a commutative Banach algebra, 
I have to apologize, except for a little interlude near the beginning. This talk is about commutative Banach algebras. So not very non-commutative, I'm afraid. Though I mean, there are matrices. It's a little bit non-commutative. Uh, anyway, if you have a commutative Banach algebra, and if it's finitely generated, then its, it's Gelfand spectrum naturally sits inside of a CN because you just evaluate a multiplicative linear function along the generators of the algebra, and that gives an embedding from multi -linear, um, multiplicative linear functionals into CN. And uh, first of all, it's a homeomorphism onto a compact set. And secondly, the image, you can easily check this, the image is always a compact and polynomially convex subset of CN. These generators are Banach algebra generators, not C star algebra generators. So for example, if you're dealing with the continuous functions on the circle, you need two generators. You need Z and Z bar. Uh, and this embedding would embed the, the circle inside of C2 in the way that I was describing before in this totally real submanifold of Z comma Z bar. All right, very good. And that, as we saw, that's uh, an example of a polynomially convex set. So uh, you see, polynomially convex sets all the time if you're playing around with Banach algebras because every Gelfand uh, spectrum is an example. You can sort of go in the other direction. Uh, if you have a polynomially convex uh, set inside of CN, you can build a Banach algebra from it in, in an extremely natural way. You just take the complex polynomial functions on X and then you take the uniform closure in, yeah, the uniform norm, the supremum norm as functions just on X uh, and you get yourself a Banach algebra. I'm gonna call that B of X. And there's going to be B of X's throughout this talk. So uh, you have to make your peace with B of X because uh, that's what we're going to be talking about. If X is the closed unit disk, this is what people call a disk algebra, which you can read about in Ron Douglas's book, for example. And uh, as for X, you can recover it from B of X because evaluation at each point of X, of course, is a multiplicative linear functional on B of X. And just like uh, Ron showed in his book, uh, maybe he told us to show in an exercise, I don't remember. Uh, those are the only multiplicative linear functionals. So the, the, the Gelfand spectrum of B of X is, is the X uh, you started with. As for the Gelfand uh, transform, uh, here it just becomes the inclusion of, of B of X into C of X. I guess that's evident from what, what I just said. So this is a situation um, which is sort of universal in, in the sense that if you have any Banach algebra, as long as it's finitely generated, you, it gives rise to an X, which is one of these uh, polynomially convex sets. And from that, you can build a B of X and the Gelfand transform from any Banach algebra A into C of X factors through B of X in an obvious way. And uh, this is really the theorem uh, that I'd like to try and explain uh, to you uh, in this talk, which is a beautiful thing. I learned this uh, at the very beginning of my career from reading uh, Joe Taylor's notes on, on K-theory. And uh, what it says is that if you have any commutative Banach algebra, then the Gelfand transform induces an isomorphism in K-theory. It's just so simple and in statement and uh, comprehensive and clean. Uh, it was uh, made an instant impression on me. And so I've been thinking about this for <clears throat> quite a few years uh, now. And finally, I decided to do something about it and try and learn this uh, properly. So the goal of the talk is to uh, explain to you uh, how this uh, is proved, uh, it should be evident that there's some sort of close connection with uh, Oka's principle here. Uh, there are various ways of uh, explaining this. Uh, for example, the, the, the Banach algebra B of X, thanks to some of the work of Oka, you can think of B of X in, in a slightly different way. Rather than taking the uniform closure of polynomial functions on X, you can just take the uniform, or you can take, maybe I should say in addition, the uniform closure of all holomorphic functions, which are defined in a neighborhood of X. A priori, that's a larger collection of functions, because every polynomial function is holomorphic, but any function which is holomorphic in a neighborhood of X turns out to be uniformly approximable by polynomial functions. So you could think of B of X in terms of holomorphic functions defined in a, in a neighborhood of X, and now it looks rather like what I said Oka's principle was uh, earlier on. And uh, in, in the other direction, uh, from, from what I just said, if you happen to believe in the Oka principle, you just want to take it off the shelf uh, and use it, then it's very, very easy to, to combine Oka's principle with some elementary arguments to actually prove, um, to prove uh, Novodvorsky's theorem. And uh, so that's the shortest proof. If you just accept Oka's principle, then you're done. You just uh, do a little bit of exercise. Uh, and you have for yourself a proof of Novodvorsky's theorem. That's pretty much what Novodvorsky did. Uh, there were several precursors, I, I guess I should say. Ahrens had, had essentially the same theorem, but he had the bad luck 
not to mention the magic phrase K theory. So his theorem isn't as memorable, um, but he also just pulled Oka's principle of his theorem of Grout uh, off the shelf. Uh, what I'd like to do here is uh, um, not do that, not take this result uh, just for granted, but rather I want to examine how to prove this theorem from first principles because I have other potential uh, applications uh, in mind, but um, I'll get to that in, in just a moment. First of all, let's just make some simple uh, reductions. Uh, it's no uh, harm at all to consider just finitely generated Banach algebras because, that, because every Banach algebra is a uniform limit of, uh, excuse me, a, a direct limit of uh, finitely generated Banach algebras. And so I won't say anything more about that. Uh, from now on, every Banach algebra is finitely generated. Uh, in fact, I'm only going to really seriously be considering these B of X algebras that I just defined for you uh, a moment ago. And uh, I'm going to get away with that just for the reasons that I mentioned uh, uh, earlier on. If you have any uh, commutative Banach algebra A, and if it's finitely generated, then the Galpin spectrum sits inside of Cn as a compact and polynomially convex set. And uh, as I said earlier on, the Galpin transform factors through B of X, from A to B of X to C of X. And it's not difficult at all to show that the induced map from A into, uh, from the K theory of A into the K theory of B of X, it's not difficult to at all to show that that map uh, is an isomorphism. That's a K theory isomorphism. Uh, what's difficult about this um, theorem is to go from B of X to C of X. That's not trivial at all. But to go from our arbitrary random A in, into one of these B of X's, that's pretty easy. I'll explain why uh, later on. So it's really all about the algebras B of X. Those are the ones uh, which tell you uh, everything. And those are the ones that I'm going to be focusing on when I get around to trying to prove this theorem, which is what's going to happen uh, in a little while. But first, uh, let's, let's take a little break from this relentless onslaught of, of commutative algebras and uh, say something a little bit non-commutative, um, because that's what the seminar is. It's a non-commutative uh, geometry seminar. All right, and uh, so a few slides about my favorite, uh, one of my favorite topics, the, the representation theory, especially the tempered representation theory of uh, real reductive groups. And uh, we'll get to it in, in a slide or two, the, the Con Kasparov isomorphism from the good old days in the 1980s. And uh, okay, so uh, throughout this, in order to be as explicit as possible, I'm just going to study one example. Uh, which is the example where the group, the Lie group is SL2R and, and uh, it'll also be important to specify its maximal compact subgroup uh, SO2. In this particular example, you can calculate everything. And uh, so it's a little bit misleading in, in that uh, the, the algebras uh, that you can define uh, in, in the case of SL2R, you can just see exactly what they are and you can check everything by hand. Nevertheless, it's, uh, I'm just going to limit myself to this to to, to try and give you an idea of what you might be able to do with a Novodvorsky theorem if you could push the Novodvorsky theorem a bit beyond uh, the commutative into the slightly non-commutative realm. All right, so here are some algebras. Uh, the first one is Harish Chandra's algebra. This is an algebra of functions on G. It sits inside of the C star algebra of G. The multiplication is, is convolution multiplication. It's always called curly C of G. And it's dense and holomorphically closed. So as far as K-theory is concerned, the K-theory of C of G, Harish Chandra's algebra is the same, th same thing as the K-theory of C star of G, uh, C star reduced of G, which is the sort of thing that we're supposed to uh, like in this seminar. There's another algebra which is called the Schwartz algebra. Harish Chandra's algebra is sometimes also called the Schwartz algebra, but this is, this is better deserving of the name Sch Schwartz uh, algebra. And it, it's something that you build using the structure that G has uh, as, a, as a manifold, specifically as a real algebraic manifold. If you think about SL2R, for example, it's a real algebraic variety, isn't it? It's just the set of all four tuples which satisfy the equation AD minus BC equals one. Uh, and so it sits inside of R4 and it's defined by equations. And, and there's always in that situation a natural short space um, of, of functions in the case of R, it just agrees if, if your algebraic variety just happens to be affine space, it's the usual Laurent Schwartz space. But in general, there's, there's a, a natural Schwartz space on any one of these so-called uh, uh, Nash manifolds. Uh, and, and it's called, always called curly S of G and it was invented by, by Castleman and Wallach and it's usually called Castleman's Schwartz algebra. It consists of functions which are super rapidly decreasing on the group. They decay to zero faster than any exponential. 
So they're not just in L2, they're in L1. They're not just in L1, they're in whatever you like. They're, they're in L1 in spades. These are very, very small functions. This is a dense subalgebra of the C star algebra, but it sure isn't holomorphically closed. So it's complicated to understand the relationship between S of G and, well, C star reduced of G or, or curly C of G. And the final algebra I wrote down is some algebraic, um, I don't know, skeleton on which you can, from which you can build up both S of G and C of G, as I'll explain in a moment. Uh, and it just consists of distributions, not, not functions on G anymore, but distributions on G, distributions which are compactly supported and the support sits inside of this compact subgroup K. That's the Hecke algebra that the representation theorists like who study GK modules, because the module over this algebra is a GK module. So we have three uh, algebras. And uh, what I'm going to do is slightly uh, cut them down to make three more convenient algebras, which are a little less, a um, little more easy to study. Suppose I have a collection of weights, so representations of SO2 integers. Uh, and uh, so I'm gonna call it S and I'll, I'll be working with the example, which consists of the weights minus two, zero and two. You'll see that in a moment. It's just a finite collection of weights. Each time you have uh, an element in any one of these algebras, uh, because the group K acts on G on the both left and right, you can, you can do Fourier theory and you can attempt to decompose any element in any one of these algebras as, as a Fourier series. And I'm interested in the sub algebras where the Fourier coefficients are all zero, both the left and the right. Fourier coefficients are all zero, except for the specific weights which belong to S. So these are corners inside of uh, the, the three algebras that we spoke about, uh, H, S, and, and curly C. There, there, there are projections in the multiplier algebra, and if you cut down by those projections, you get these uh, corners. All right, and uh, the, yeah, here it is, the famous con kasparov isomorphism, proved by Wasserman and, and then proved again by uh, Vincent Lafourche. Uh, states that the, the K-theory groups of the S algebras are the same thing as the K-theory groups of the, the curly C algebras, or if you like, the reduced C star algebras. That's not exactly what it says, but this is easily equivalent to the statement. And this is not a trivial uh, statement at all. There's no obvious reason why uh, there should be a K-theory isomorphism like this. For example, on the right-hand side, there are lots of actual idempotents in the, in, in the right-hand side algebras, the C-star algebras, or even the Harish-Chandra algebras, coming from discrete series, but, but they don't exist on the left-hand side. There are basically, not quite, but, oh, look, I'm right, de dealing with S here. There are no idempotents that can be categorical. There are no idempotents in the, in the, in the Frechet algebra on the right-hand side. There are lots of idempotents on the left-hand side. So it's not so easy to match up K-theory classes uh, on the left and on the right. Nevertheless, there is an isomorphism. And uh, people have thought uh, since the beginning of this subject, uh, since the 1980s, that somehow the Oka principle ought to be involved here. Something like Novodvorsky's theorem ought to be involved. The, 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 the statement, as I've written it here, has a sort of Novodvorsky-ish um, air to it. You have some, I don't know, Banach or Frechet algebra, and you're mapping it into a C-star algebra. You want to get an associated isomorphism in K-theory. So uh, let's just see uh, how likely it is to, that one could make uh, some kind of Oka principle here, some kind of Novodvorsky theorem, and, and apply it to the Con Kasparov isomorphism. This is what we're thinking about right now. So although you can do calculations for SL2, and it's not a big deal, um, we're, we're interested in handling general groups, and, and we haven't done it. So that's not what I'm going to be talking about. I'll just be talking about Novodvorsky. But we wanted to go back and understand the argument with these generalizations in mind. Anyway, here's a picture of the dual, the set of all irreducible representations of uh, SL2R. They, they come in two sheets, an even sheet and an odd sheet. Uh, the representations in the even sheet um, decompose into even weights of, of SO2, and the ones on the odd sheet just uh, odd weights only. And it's a little bit uh, interesting. There are some double point, one double point, I guess, lots of triple points lots of non-Hausdorff areas in, in the temper dual. Most of it, as you can see, is Hausdorff, a few little non-Hausdorff points. What you see in red is the temper dual. This is what the dual of the reduced C-star algebra looks like. Ah, not exactly, because I, I didn't divide out by a symmetry which exists in both of these pictures on both of the sheets. So you're supposed to identify the representations at a point Z with the uh, representations at a point minus Z. So this line in, in the front uh, sheet, for example, gets folded in two and all of the, the dots on the left-hand side of the line get identified with, with dots on the right-hand side of the line. 
All right, so what do these algebras actually look like? Well, it's kind of uh, interesting. Here's an example. Uh, if you take uh, these three weights, this is the first really interesting uh, example. If S consists of minus two, two and zero, this is the example, the first example, which is big enough to include both principal and discrete series for, for SL2R. Uh, if S is that three element set, then this algebraical he Hecke algebra under a Fourier transform uh, looks like an algebra of three by three matrix valued polynomial functions or uh, matrices of polynomials. And, and you can say exactly what's going on. All of the polynomial matrix valued functions have to look like what you see in the picture, uh, which is, uh, well, the A's are supposed to be even polynomials. So actually polynomials of Z squared. And then there are some multipliers that you have to throw in Z plus one, Z minus one, and Z squared minus one and so on. So that's, uh, that's an algebra and, and that's uh, what you get. The plus and minus ones have to do with these dots, which I showed you in the previous picture on the even front pane, the, the first dots that you encounter to the left and right of the, the red line, uh, the first dots are, are at the point plus or minus one. All right, let me try and coax this back. Here we go. Uh, so these things were studied in, in some detail by Bernstein, Gelfand and Gelfand, and then again by Bernstein with two other students, uh, Gates, Gorey and Braverman. And so a lot is known about these algebras. And uh, yes, so that's the algebraical object, uh, the, the Hecke algebra, the A's are polynomials in that case. That's a little bit far away from Banach algebras uh, and, and Seaster algebras and so on. But if you look at uh, the Castleman Schwartz algebra, this, this small object, then what it consists of uh, is, uh, well, it's matrices of exactly the same sort, except that the A's are no longer polynomials. Instead, they should be holomorphic functions. And, and just for fun, I wrote down exactly what sort of holomorphic functions they should be. On each vertical strip in, in, in the complex plane, uh, the, the function should be rapidly decaying, exactly like you see. They should go to zero faster than any polynomial goes to infinity. All right, that's what the, the kassman schwartz uh, algebra looks like. We'll discuss the C-star algebra in, in a little while. Um, uh, but one thing you can extract from this is that there's a simple relationship between the, the Kassman algebra and the Hecke algebra. Uh, namely, if you start off with a Hecke algebra and you base change, you tensor over polynomials with holomorphic functions, so curly Z is supposed to be the center of the enveloping algebra of G, but it, you can think of it as just the even polynomials. If you form this base change operation, then you go from the algebraic Hecke algebra of um, compactly supported distributions to this, this um, convolution algebra of rapidly decaying smooth functions, S of G of S. All right, so it's a very simple picture so far. Now, let's try and get serious about an, an Ocker principle. Here's something which looks much more like an Ocker principle than my formulation of the Kahn Kasparov uh, isomorphism. I want to replace this algebra of holomorphic functions, this commutative algebra of even holomorphic functions A. These are the holomorphic functions A, remember, with holomorphic functions, which on each vertical strip go to zero faster than any polynomial. I want to replace it by an algebra of C infinity functions. So just C infinity functions on, a, and on, on each strip, I want them to be Schwartz class, if you like, uniformly Schwartz class on all of the lines in each strip. Uh, I guess I didn't write that. Oh, I did say uniformly Schwartz class. Okay. So A sits inside of C. And, um, and so there's another base change uh, operation. You can go from the tensor product uh, of the Hecke algebra with A to the tensor product of the Hecke algebra with C. Okay, you replace holomorphic functions by, well, not continuous functions, but, but, but smooth functions. I could talk about continuous functions, but it's just a, a little more convenient to, to use these Schwartz functions. Uh, and now you can ask, is this map an isomorphism in K-theory? And now it looks awfully, it looks awfully like uh, Novodvorsky's theorem. We have an algebra on the left, which is holomorphic matrix valued functions. And we have an algebra on the right, which is smooth matrix valued functions. And I'd like to know that the inclusion of one into the other is an isomorphism in K-theory. And uh, for reasons that I'll show you on the next slide, you can check this in, in, in super easy cases, just uh, probably by, by eye, by hand. Uh, so the first two cases, which are slightly easier than the one I mentioned, uh, are where S, the set S consists of any one element. And then this Hecke algebra turns out just to be the, the, polyn the even polynomials. And so what we're talking about is the inclusion of A into C. Uh, 
And that is an isomorphism in K-theory. Well, both algebras have zero K-theory, but it is an isomorphism. In the next case, uh, if S is minus one and one, then, then both algebras have K-theory exactly Z, and uh, the map is an isomorphism too. Okay, let me try and explain what this has to do with uh, Kahn Kasparov and C star algebras uh, and so on. Inside of the tempered dual, inside, excuse me, inside of the admissible dual, inside of these um, sheets of, of representations, there are the tempered representations, those were I wrote in red. And if you look at what's in each sheet, what's in, in the tempered dual, but not, excuse me, what's in the admissible dual in gray, but not in the tempered dual in red, the tempered dual is the dual of the reduced C-star algebra. What's left is described by, by Langlands, and, and what's left is a contractible space. It kind of looks like, uh, well, in the even sh um, sheet, just a strip, just a contractible strip. And indeed, that's exactly what it is. And, and the odd sheet, uh, exactly the same. And Langland says that this is some uh, universal truth. If you look at what's in the admissible dual, but not in the tempered dual, according to Langlands, it's extremely easy to describe what that is. And in particular, it's contractible. And uh, so something rather interesting happens. If you perform this base change operation that I was describing a moment ago, replacing holomorphic functions by smooth functions, and then you restrict to the red, to the tempered dual, you actually get a subjective map onto the, onto the Harris-Chandra algebra, this curly C algebra. And that's ah, a subjective map. That's kind of interesting from the point of view of K-theory because of the six term exact sequence. What about the ideal? Well, the ideal, uh, if you convert it from a Frechet algebra into a Banach algebra, in which it sits in a holomorphically closed way, uh, then what you get is a contractible algebra. Uh, to, or to be honest, uh, it's Marita equivalent to a contractible algebra. So there's a natural subjection here, and, and the ideal is, for a very trivial reason, an ideal with zero K-theory. And so this subjection induces an isomorphism on K-theory. And that proves that the map from S of G of S, the Casimir algebra for S, to the Harris-Chandra algebra for S is an isomorphism in K-theory. OK, so that's the argument we have in mind. And it depends on understanding, on the previous page, this uh, isomorphism in K-theory. And that's why I'm now going to spend a bit of time showing you or investigating uh, what Novodvorsky uh, did, or rather what you can do to prove Novodvorsky's theorems from, from, from first principles. OK, so that's um, an advertisement for, for why you might uh, care about a theorem like Novodvorsky's theorem, even if you only care about non-commutative algebras. Oh, there's Langlands just poking another button there. All right, and so now I'm going to describe uh, the argument to you. I started to, to think a little more seriously about this after learning about Novodvorsky's theorem in, when I was a young lad. Uh, I started to think a little more serious about this just a few years ago. And um, I was teaching a class in topology at the same time. So on Thursdays, I was giving my seminar in, to my graduate students on, on this uh, Novodvorsky stuff. And on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, I was teaching algebraic topology. And it struck me after a certain while that I was teaching exactly the same thing in both classes. So let me remind you just a, a little bit about uh, some very famous result in algebraic topology. Uh, here's the jordan Kerf theorem, or the higher dimensional jordan Brau theorem, which says that if you stick an n minus 1 sphere inside of an n sphere in some possibly complicated way, like you see in this picture, which has a circle embedded into a two sphere. If you do it, then the complement has uh, precisely two components. That's the Jordan curve theorem when n is equal to two and the Jordan Brow theorem uh, in general. I discovered that there's an entire uh, internet subculture. I ought to have just predicted this, but there's an entire group of people who are just dedicated to illustrating the Jordan curve theorem by drawing fancy pictures like this. So we'll, we'll look at another one in, in just a while. Anyway, how do you, how do you prove this thing? Well, if, if you're teaching a class in singular homology, this is how you do it. You, uh, first of all, you do a simple reduction, which I won't describe, and, and get the thing down to the following statement, which has a very similar sound to it. And, and by May of Iatoris, it turns out to be exactly the same. If you take, uh, instead of a, an n sphere, or excuse me, an n minus one sphere sitting inside a and then sphere, if you embed, it's important that it be an embedding here. If you embed topologically a K cube into an N sphere, it doesn't matter what K is, then the complement is looks like a point and, and looks like means it has the same singular homology as a point. It's not contractible necessarily because of the horn sphere examples and, and other things like it, um, but it has the homology of a point. 
And uh, this is uh, standard fare in, in a first course in algebraic topology for good reason, because it's a fantastic advertisement for the power of these algebraic uh, methods. And let me just remind you how this proof goes. If in case it's been a while since you taught a course like this, it's, it's just a lot of uh, fun. Uh, you prove it by buying yourself a little time. First of all, you say, suppose not. And um, if, if the theorem is false, then there's the smallest k for any given n. There's the smallest k for which is, it's false. So you assume that the theorem is true for all k minus 1 cubes. It's always true for 0 cubes, for example. You assume the theorem is true for k minus 1 cubes but false for, for k cubes embedded into Cn. And then you see what you can do. If the theorem is false, then the sum cube C embedded into an n-sphere and some element of some homology group of the complement, which is not uh, which is not zero, but it maps to zero in the homology of a point. That's what it means for the theorem to be false. All right, and so the trick is very, very, very simple. You take the cube and you just chop it in two. So what you do, for the chopping is you take the original cube, which is a product of intervals sitting inside of uh, abstract, uh, I don't know, k-dimensional space, and you cleanly chop it exactly into half, into two equal halves along some, uh, along some midplane. And you get yourself two abstract, well, they're still topological cubes, C and C prime boxes, I guess you could call them. And, uh, and then you examine the Mayovia torus sequence that is associated to this chopping. Because you're looking at complements, the Mayovia torus sequence sort of goes, you know, in the opposite direction than what you might expect. And in particular, the homology group where this counterexample X lives uh, is mapped to the homology groups uh, of the complements of C and C prime. And it's easy to check from Mayovia torus and, and the assumption you made for a contradiction that uh, the X element has to survive uh, as you map from the complement of C to the complement of one of C prime or C double prime, or of course, maybe both. So you just choose one of them, say C prime, uh, and now you have a smaller counterexample. Uh, the counterexample uh, in which the cube in which is embedded is, is only half the size as it was before. And then you just repeat, it's a cube again, so you can chop it into two. And all of these chops should be parallel to one another, like you had a loaf of bread and you chopped it once and you chopped it again, and sliced it along the same set of planes like you would for a, you know making toast. Uh, and then you'll get a sequence of complements, uh, Sn take away C, Sn take away C1, Sn take away C2, di da di da di da. And this element X, which was the counterexample, will live as you map from space to space to space. Each time it'll be non-zero, and so it'll be non-zero in the direct limit. That's just algebra. But the direct limit of the homology groups is just the homology of the direct limit of the spaces, which is just Sn take away the intersection of the Cj's. But if you intersect these spaces cj which you obtain one from the next by bisecting then the intersection of the cj's is not a k cube anymore it's a k minus one cube and so you have a counterexample to the theorem for a k minus one cube which is not possible because you rented contradiction land and so on and so forth okay so that's how the argument goes it's really beautiful and simple and you can explain the whole thing uh, with with a total rigor uh, in a beginning class uh, so this famous um, obstacle for mathematicians, the jordan curve theorem is, is handled beautifully by this algebra. Here we go, here's another example of the, of the uh, cult of uh, the jordan curve theorem illustrations. And we're going to prove Novodvorsky's theorem in, in basically the same way. This is how it's done, and that's uh, kind of fun. All right, so uh, back to uh, Novodvorsky. Um, I, actually, before I start, maybe I should say that, that uh, although um, no, I decided I'm not going to say that. We'll just uh, continue. So I'll try and stay on schedule a little bit. Uh, back to Bonnach algebras and, and K theory. Uh, it's sort of obvious, I think, from the advertisement I just gave, from the discussion of homology theory that I just gave, that the Maya Via Torres is going to be central to the whole enterprise. So um, in order to prove this theorem, I'll have to remind you of a few very basic facts about Maya Via Torres. Of course, this is uh, bread and butter for people in, in K theory, no, no big deal at all. Nevertheless, I'll talk about it a little bit. We need a slightly better Mayavia torus sequence than the one that you usually see, uh, if, for example, in C star algebra K theory, and uh, which uh, was actually proved by Jean Benoit Bost. So I'll, I'll describe Jean Benoit's improved Mayavia torus sequence. Uh, and then that's really the main deal, or a few other things uh, uh, from ab abstract K theory that we need, some, some 
variation on Gelfand's fam famous theorem about invertible elements in the Gelfand transform, we'll need compatibility of K-theory with direct limits. That's no big deal at all. Uh, and then finally, we're going to stir all of these things together and hopefully cook a proof of a Mayer-Torres theorem for the algebras B of X. Once we have Mayer-Torres for B of X, we'll just follow the recipe I just showed you to somehow uh, prove the Novodvorsky theorem in the following way. If, if the theorem is false, uh, if Novodvorsky's theorem is false, it's false for some specific X. If it's false for some specific X, it's false for a smaller X you get by chopping X exactly into two pieces by some hyperplane. And if it's false uh, for one of those half pieces, it's also false for a quarter piece and then a uh, and then an eighth piece and, and so on. And so it's false for a small, in the end, in the limit, it'll be false for a space of smaller dimension. So if there's any counterexample at all of dimension K, there's an example, counterexample of dimension K minus one. Okay, but the theorem has no counterexamples at all if the dimension of X is zero. So that's the, the final punchline. All right, just some extremely elementary uh, things here. Uh, I, these slides are slightly reused, and, and so it's hardly necessary for me to say anything about these topics in, in this particular to this particular audience. If you have a morphism of Banach algebras, then it has a mapping cone, which is defined in the usual way, and, and the algebra, any Banach algebra, has a suspension, which is defined in the usual way, just functions into B from an interval, which vanish at both endpoints. And the suspension and the mapping cone and the domain of uh, the morphism are all related by a little short exact sequence like this. And, uh, and so there's an associated six term exact sequence in, in K theory, and this is what it looks like. Uh, so each morphism gives rise to a K theory uh, exact sequence, and this is what it looks like. There's no special ideal anymore, but, but the, the, the role of the ideal, so to speak, is played, for by, the, played by this mapping cone, the K theory of this mapping cone. All right, here's something very slightly more complicated. Suppose you have not one morphism, but two morphisms. Uh, like I showed you, then you can build a so-called double mapping cone, uh, which consists of triples, like you see, an element from B and an element from C and, and a function in D. Uh, and when you evaluate the function at the two endpoints, you get the two elements B and C, like you see. And uh, Okay, it's an easy construction and it gives rise in, in almost exactly the same way to a double mapping cone exact sequence, which is practically the same as the exact sequence we were just uh, looking at just a moment ago. All right. And uh, this allows us to frame the discussion of Mea Via Torres in a, in a reasonably abstract way. If you have a slightly bigger diagram, before we just had a B and a C and a D, there it was at the top of the screen. Now we have an A and a B and a C and a D, a little commuting diagram like this. If you have such a commuting diagram, there's a morphism of Banach algebras from A into the double mapping cone that I just defined, because an element of a double mapping cone is an element of B plus an element of C plus a function into D. But if you have an element of the Banach algebra A in the diagram at the top of the screen, obviously you get an element of B and you get an element of C and you get a function into D, namely the constant function uh, whose value is equal to the image of that element of A either way around the diagram. So there's an obvious canonical morphism and if that morphism is an isomorphism in K-theory, then you can substitute the double mapping cone for A or substitute A for the double mapping cone in the previous six-term exact sequence and you'll get a Mayer-Via Torres sequence. So we'll say that the diagram has the Mayer-Via Torres sequence if this morphism that I just described, the canonical morphism, is an isomorphism in K-theory. This is the convenient way to speak about things as, as, as we go along. And uh, what you read about uh, in the textbooks is the following theorem. If you have a square and if it's a pullback square, and if one of the morphisms from uh, B or C into D is surjective, then by virtue of a simple manipulation involving uh, the six term exact sequence for an ideal, by virtue of such a ma manipulation, you see that you, you do indeed have a Mayer-Torres, the Mayer-Torres property. And so a Mayer-Torres sequence. You can read about this, for example, in Milner's algebraic K-theory book. It's, it's not actually about topology at all. It's just about algebraic K-theory. And here's a variation, a very beautiful uh, variation due to Jean Benoit. And so he, this is not exactly uh, in his uh, famous paper on the non-commutative Oka principle. Um, he discovered it, I think, a little bit later. And um, there's a story attached to that, but let me just press on here. 
Here's what the theorem says. It says that if you have a commutative diagram uh, as you did before, if it's still a pullback square, so in other words, A is determined by the rest of the diagram, and if it satisfies this range plus range condition, as I'll call it, that the image of phi plus the image of psi is all of D. The previous theorem says that one of the image of phi or the image of psi should be all of D, but if, if together they cooperate and give uh, all of D, uh, then you have a Mayavia torus sequence. And there's just a little footnote, which is that in order to make the proof actually work, you also have to assume that one of phi of psi or psi at least has dense image. So this is a theorem. It's not actually that difficult uh, to prove if you go about it the right way. If you think about this from the perspective of algebraic topology uh, and vibrations, it's, it's really not difficult at all to prove. Um, but it's a very beautiful uh, statement. Of course, you don't see it in C-star algebras, do you? Because if you have a C-star morphism which is dense, then it's automatically subjective. So you're never going to be able to apply this in the C-star world. But, but in in the Barnack algebra world, you, you see it all the time, especially in the context of complex variables. So we'll use that uh, in due course, excuse me, and we'll also use Galfand's uh, famous theorem, which is really the first application of complex analysis to Barnack algebras. Uh, so Galfand said that if you have an element in a commutative Barnack algebra, then uh, it's invertible if and only if its Galfand uh, transform is invertible. Uh, and the same thing is true for matrices, because a matrix is invertible if and only if its determinant is invertible. And you can fit this into the well-known Karubi density theorem to conclude something that I'll call the gelfand karubi theorem. It says that if you have a morphism of commutative Barnack algebras, and if it has dense image, that's important. Uh, and if it induces a homeomorphism on Gelfand spectra, then it induces an isomorphism in K-theory. And it's extremely important to, to, to note that you have to assume dense image here, otherwise you can't apply Karubi density and, and you're stuck. Um, so this is a lovely result, uh, but it, it doesn't immediately apply to Novodvorsky where the, the image is certainly not dense. Indeed, B of X is a closed subalgebra of C of X, so you can't directly apply it to the inclusion of B of X into C of X. On the other hand, it does allow you to reduce uh, Novodvorsky's theorem from any A to one of these B of X algebras, because any finitely generated A maps into a B of X in, in a way which uh, satisfies this um, spectral spectrum preserving condition. And so as soon as you prove Novodvorsky for B of X, you're done. So now that's what we'll try to do. I'm not even going to spend any time on that slide. I'm just pointing out that Barnack uh, algebra K theory is compatible with direct limits. Uh, let's just move on. Here's the main issue. This is what it all comes down to, is to try to figure out how to get uh, off the ground uh, in this cutting and chopping argument, this Jordan curve cutting and chopping argument, by establishing a Mayavia torus sequence for the B algebras. You can put it like this, that if Novodvorsky's theorem is true, then the k-theory of the B algebras is equal to the k-theory of the C algebras, just C of x, C of x prime, and so on. And certainly there's a Mayavia torus sequence in ordinary topological k-theory, k-theory of C-star algebras for these C algebras. So if Novodvorsky's theorem is true, then there is a Mayavia torus sequence, so you might as well try to prove this anyway. And uh, the good news is that once you've proved this theorem, in, in, in fact, you're done. The, the rest of the argument, as I'll remind you, just show you at the end, is extremely simple. So this is what we want to prove, what I want to prove in the remaining part of this uh, talk. So we have a polynomially convex, compact subset C, uh, excuse me, X of, of CN. Uh, and, and I want to imagine that this X is cleanly chopped in two. It's chopped in two by a real hyperplane, uh, which I've described using the language of a linear functional, a level set of a linear functional. Uh, but it, I just, uh, I'm just thinking of a, an X sitting inside of CN and uh, I attack it with an extremely sharp knife, one of those Japanese knives, whack, now I chop it into two bits, uh, X and X prime. And they meet, they uh, meet along a common uh, boundary, X intersection, X prime, which certainly has lower dimension. It's smaller in an obvious sense than, than X, the X that you started with, assuming X, let's say, had some uh, interior to start with. Okay, so this is what I want to try and explain to you. And um, the first thing to say is that it's almost trivial. It's almost trivial because uh, of a famous result in in complex variables, which is basically due to Oka, by the way. Um, but these days people just say theorem B because it gets the idea across right away. If you have a holomorphic function on any intersection like uh, you see here inside of a, a polynomially 
convex, compact set X. If you have any function which is holomorphic in a neighborhood of X intersection X prime, it's always the sum of a function on X prime, near which is holomorphic near X prime, and a function which is holomorphic near X double prime. This is what uh, this is a foundational result in several several complex variables, and it almost says that this diagram satisfies the range plus range condition in Bost's theorem. Almost, but not exactly, because b uh, b of x is a Banach algebra obtained by completing spaces of functions which are holomorphic in neighborhoods. Blah blah blah. And um, so, because the theorem is about Banach algebras, and Cartan's theorem b is about, if you like, Frechet algebras, you're not quite there, there's a little gap. And so you may say, well, just prove a better version of Bose's theorem, but that's not so easy because Bose's theorem uses the inverse function theorem and that doesn't work so well for fresh A algebras. So it's all a little bit uh, delicate. You're almost there just by, by Cartan's theorem B, but, but not exactly. Okay, but uh, here is uh, going to, here's how we're going to prove this thing anyway by a sequence of uh, reductions. And I just want to give you the flavor of these rather than lead you through every possible um, detail here. First of all, um, each time we have a compact set X, uh, we could imagine fattening it up a little bit and forming some set XM, which is a little bit bigger, like a one over M neighborhood, closed one over M neighborhood of, of X. Uh, and then as M goes to infinity, the XMs will converge down to x, and we can certainly replace the k-theory of b of x by this direct limit because they're one and the same and using the continuity of k-theory. And if it helps, we can replace any comp polynomially convex compact set x by a sequence of fattenings xm, just like I've uh, shown you here. And that allows you to do the following thing, which is uh, uh, actually very important. Namely, it allows you to replace x by what's called a, a, a polynomial polyhedron. It's an X which is defined by a finite number of polynomial inequalities like you see. That's because you can always build neighborhoods of polynomially convex sets, compact neighborhoods uh, in exactly uh, this way. So if you can prove the theorem for compact polynomial polyhedra, then you're done. You've proved it for all uh, X by some continuity argument. And if you like, you can combine uh, the first two points uh, in a different way to get a new third point because you can also fatten up the polynomial polyhedron by replacing the estimate one, the bound one by one plus one over n, something like that. Uh, and, and now try and prove the, the Mayavia torus property for this sequence of XMs, or if you like, the Mayavia torus property in the direct limit for this sequence of XMs. That in fact is exactly what we're going to do. And that puts us into the territory of Oka, the work that Oka did around the time of the war. And he, he gave a very interesting picture of what one of these polynomially convex, excuse me, what one of these polynomial polyhedra looks like, which is not, I mean, it's really trivial uh, after you think about it, but it's, it's really quite surprising otherwise. Um, I want to um, introduce some new sets here, Z. So the Zs are polydisks. They're just defined by simple inequalities, no polynomials at all. They're just disk times disk times disk a certain number of times. So ZM is a polydisc. And I want to choose this radius R that you see in the formula for ZM. I want to ch choose it big enough so that X sits inside or XM sits inside of ZM. So I just choose a big R, big R, R is a million, something like that. Now, let me imagine embedding um, little z, it should have been little z, not big z, a point of XM into a point of ZM using the polynomials P1 up to PK, which define the polynomial polyhedron XM. If you do that, then first of all, you'll see that the map is well-defined from XM into ZM. It, it embeds XM as a closed subset of ZM, and it embeds it precisely as the zero set of a bunch of polynomials. So what Ocker observed is that every polynomial polyhedron is the intersection of a polydisc with an algebraic set defined by these polynomials QJ. And so uh, what Ocker was able to do was um, make the uh, analysis of polynomially convex sets very closely related to the algebra, uh, commutative algebra of, of, of algebraic sets. And that's really the, the magic secret of, of Oka. So every XM, as long as it's a polynomial polyhedron and not a general polynomially convex set, it might as well be an algebraic set. In reality, it's an intersection of an algebraic set with a polydisc. And uh, one of the many benefits of doing that is a result which is an immediate consequence of Oka's work. It 
actually is due to a Banach algebraist called uh, Allen. And it says if you have a function on, on Z which vanishes on, on X, then actually it's, it's a combination of polynomials in exactly the way that you see here. The Qs generate the, the vanishing ideal of XM as it sits inside of ZM. Well, that's not exactly true, but it's true if you shrink the functions a little bit or expand the, the sets uh, a little bit. Uh, as is indicated uh, in, in the exact statement. That's the reason that we are interested in choosing not just one Z, not just one X, for example, but a sequence X1, X2, X3, X4. All right, so this would be obvious in the language of uh, just polynomials, but it's also true in the language of uh, polynomially convex sets by virtue of this perspective of, of Oka. And uh, <clears throat> it allows us to make another uh, reduction here, now using the ideas of Gelfand. Let me define A of X, 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 excuse me, X now sits inside of Z. X, the polynomially convex set, is realized inside of Z, the polydisc, as, as a certain, uh, I don't know, semi-algebraic set. Uh, define A to be just the quotient of the functions on Z modulo the vanishing ideal. Uh, and then there's an obvious evaluation map from A of X to, to B of X. Uh, and it's a K-theory isomorphism. Why is it a K-theory isomorphism? Well, it follows from this easy Karubi density argument and Gelfand's theorem. This is not a difficult theorem. So if you want to prove a mayer torus property for the algebras A, it suffice, excuse me, B, it suffices to prove a mayer torus property for the algebras A, because the algebras A and the algebras B of XM have the same K-theory. Great, and, and the, the reason that that's interesting is that it, as for polydisks, it's easy to see that for polydisks, by virtue of ve their very simple geometry, the range plus range uh, uh, hypothesis in Bose's theorem is true. If you have a polydisk and you chop it into two bits with a sharp knife, then it is true that there is a um, commuting square which satisfies this range plus range condition. And if it's true for the Bs, it's also true for the As, because the As are a quotient of the Bs, and it's a simple diagram chase to see that this range plus range condition persists under taking quotient algebras. So it looks like we're real close. We want to build, we want to prove a mayer torus uh, theorem. We have Jean Benoit's abstract theorem available. Uh, it doesn't apply directly, as far as we know, to the B algebras, but it does apply, or so it seems, to the A algebras. On the other hand, the A algebras have the same K theory as the B algebras. So it's all looking pretty good. And there's just one fly in the ointment, which is that uh, although um, the B algebras uh, satisfy some pullback uh, condition, the square of B algebras satisfies a pullback condition, the square of A algebras is not clear if it does or not. So this A algebra square that you see at the bottom uh, in the bottom left, excuse me, right-hand corner, the range plus range hypothesis is satisfied. I don't, in fact, know if this is a pullback square. Ah, that's annoying. So we something broke. We fixed something. We, we broke something else uh, in the way. Well, no problem, um, because uh, there are at least natural maps, canonical morphisms uh, from A of XM into the, into the pullback uh, algebra, a of, which I'm calling here A of XM prime comma XM double prime. On the other hand, it falls from that Oka Allen lemma that you can you can actually build a map backwards, uh, not exactly, but you can build the map backwards if you make the small sacrifice of shrinking XM a little bit to building so that you obtain a slightly smaller space XM plus one. That follows from factorization. So it, the algebra is not a um, excuse me this this commuting square of A algebras is not a pullback square but it sort of asymptotically is in the direct limit as M goes to infinity, it is a pullback square because in the direct limit, the K theory, the direct limit of the K theory of the pullback algebras is the direct limit of the K theory of the A of X ends. And what it means is that we have a, finally a Mayavia torus sequence, not for the B algebras, not for the A algebras, but for these direct limit uh, A algebras, A of uh, XM, these direct limits as, as I've written here. But that's okay because the direct limit of the A of XMs has the same K theory as the direct limit of the B of XMs, thanks to Gelfand and Karubi. And the direct limit of the B of XMs has the same K theory as, the direct, as B of X itself, thanks to the continuity of K theory. And so finally, we proved that there is a Mayavia torus sequence for every chopping of a polynomially convex compact set into two pieces along a hyperplane. And now the rest is very easy, which is a good thing because I only have two minutes left. Uh, 
if you, so now I'm just going to emulate what I did to prove the Jordan Brar theorem in my algebraic topology class, following you know what everyone has done since Jordan and Brar, since Brar, I guess. If you have a polynomially convex uh, compact set, then you can form the, the algebra B of X that I described before this analog of the disk algebra in higher dimensions. And B of X sits inside of C of X. And so there is a mapping cone, which I'll call D of X. And I want to prove Novodvorsky's theorem, which means I want to prove that the K theory of D of X is always zero. Well, if, if the theorem is false, then uh, it's false in some minimal dimension. And I'll just show that if it's false for X, it's false for, for half of X, and then for a quarter of X, and then for an eighth of X, and so on. And in the direct limit, I'll, I'll find that it's false for an X of lower dimension, uh, and then we'll be in trouble. We will have uh, bumped right into a contradiction. Okay, and, and I'm just saying here some obvious thing that the, the D of X algebras also have a mayer torus property. It follows from the hard one mayer torus property for the B algebras and the easily one mayer torus property for the C algebras. And uh, off we go. So here's what you in, uh, induct or induce, induct, I guess, on the minimal dimension of an affine subspace, which includes your X as it sits inside of CN. Uh, and so we imagine we have a counterexample in the minimal dimension. We choose a, an, a linear functional, a direction for our cutting, um, which is non-constant on X. And, and then we just start slicing away. We cut X into two pieces, so to speak, exactly into two pieces as measured by the linear functional alpha. And, and if, uh, as you see in the diagram at the bottom, if, if, if the theorem is false for the entirety of X, which is that egg with the red line through it, then it's false for one half of uh, X, either the upper or, excuse me, the left or the right half of, of, of the egg. Let's say it's false for the right half of the egg. If it's false for the right half of the egg, then it's false either for the left or the right half of the right half of the egg. Let's say it's the left half. Now we have a smaller bit of egg where the theorem is also false. And you just keep doing this in, this, in, the, in the way that you see in the picture. And in the end, you, you, have the, the, you reach the conclusion that the theorem is false for an infinitesimally thin slice of egg. And that thin slice of egg, of course, has lower dimension. So you're done and you proved uh, Novodvorsky's theorem. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. Are there any, any questions? Always. This is the, the most depressing part of, of a Zoom seminar, isn't it? There's just this deflation at the end. So you were mentioning, can I, maybe let me add, sure. can I ask a question. So you were mentioning about how, you know, so you would like to generalize this commutative case yep. to the non-commutative yep. case. Yeah. So, uh, but for example, in the, in the example that you talked about, is that relatively straightforward, the SL? No, it's not relatively straightforward. Um, well, in the specific examples that, that I showed you, those specific matrix examples, yeah, I think it's relatively straightforward. Uh, I told you that Jacob is in Australia, which means he's still asleep right now. But it's, it's possible that he, in between talking with him a few days ago uh, and, and today, he's figured out all of the details to handle those specific cases that uh, that I showed you. I don't think those are difficult. In general, you, what confronts you is the fact that the, the, the general counterparts of those algebras for arbitrary reductive groups, uh, are they have certain pleasant algebraic properties, but, but not as simple pleasant algebraic properties as you see in those really easy examples. The, 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 the general algebras have some Cohn Macaulay property, which is quite difficult to work with. And, and so we need to master, or rather Jacob needs to master some commutative algebra uh, and combine that with this Oka technology to try and prove the theorem. I would say it's not straightforward at all. On the, on the, on the other hand, I would say it's, it's, it's highly doable. And uh, so it's in that intermediate territory. You have to combine more complicated the commutative algebra than we saw in, in Oka's principle. I, I mentioned this uh, lemma of Allen and, and Oka about uh, the vanishing ideal being generated by, by these polynomials, QJ. You're gonna to have to do 
a little more clever. You have to be more clever as a commuter to algebraist than that in order to make progress, in my, in my opinion. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other question or comment? Okay, if not, let's thank Nigel again. <laughs>